Thank you for joining us for online worship at the Downtown Church. We are continuing to follow the health department guidelines for in-person worship, which means capacity limits are removed and it's no longer necessary to RSVP for worship. Masking remains in place and our online worship will continue as it is. We're grateful for the way we're able to share worship with you, wherever you may be. This Friday is the fifth Friday, our day to deliver food items to Rare Breed. If you haven't dropped off your food items yet, bring them during our regular office hours or contact us for a time that might work better for you. One of the iconic downtown events is back this weekend. Arts Fest is happening on historic Walnut Street and our friends at the Downtown Springfield Association are asking for our help in setting up for this wonderful community event Friday afternoon and evening. If you're able to volunteer sometime, contact us and Brian will put you to work. My thanks to my friend Heather Blair, who will be bringing you the prayer and the message today. I am always grateful when she says yes to leading in worship, for I know God uses her greatly to bless us all. Let's sing and worship together. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Be thou still my strength and shield. The verge of Jordan bid my anxious fear subside. Death of death and hell's destruction land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises I will ever give to thee. I will ever give to thee. As we gather ourselves for prayer now, please remember that there's a team of downtown church folks who faithfully pray for the needs that are brought to them. If you have something you'd like to have us pray with you about, please email Lori at lori at the downtown dot church. In a week where there's been snow on tulips, some justice and loads of injustice, good news and bad news, and same old, same old news, it is absolutely okay for your mind to be all over the place, for your heart to not even know what to ask, or maybe to be way too sure. We can offer it all to God, and He can help us sort it out. Our job is not to be perfect in this moment, but just to be how we are and invite God to do the same. Embrace these moments as we sing together and let them be an invitation into the presence of God.
heart and mind are easily overwhelmed with the mountains of things that seem broken, in need of healing, of help. I'm undone by the things that we do to each other. How much greater must your grief be? Everything seems too big right now, too complicated, too messed up. So help us to take a breath. Help us to do the next good thing, which right now is to pray, to invite you into the mess and ask for your help. Put us to work one molecule at a time if that's all we can manage, but help us to be your redemption in action here on earth. When things are making less sense than snow on spring flowers, help us to return to what we know. You, your love, and these ancient words prayed by so many. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we're talking about what? what? What's the big thing that we started talking about at church in the, the last couple weeks? Yeah, the, ten, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? Um, I don't know. Okay. But one of them is treat your enemy like your neighbor. Okay. And um, so one of them is follow your parents' rules. Follow your parents' rules. <laughs> That's a good one. So uh, Pastor Lori keeps saying how, you know, when she hears the words, thou shalt not, she doesn't like it, and she gets real uh, not happy about that. What do you guys think about rules? I kind of like rules. I think rules can be a good thing sometimes. I like knowing what rules to follow and what I can get away with a little bit, so sometimes when I hear thou shalt not, I get like, oh, okay, now I know what the rules are. Does anybody have a least favorite rule? Yeah. What? My least favorite rule is you can't play tackle football at school. Okay. No tackle football at school, always. What about you? Um, that we can't go past the track. So the rule that we're talking about this week is not to put other gods before God. All right? Like so, Zeus. Like Zeus, not putting Zeus before God. Okay, so what are ways that you guys think we do a good job of keeping God first in our lives. Um, by listening to my food in the Bible. Okay. So what else? 
So going to worship regularly helps keep God in our minds and kind of from them. Because I feel like if you just play video games and you didn't go to church, mm -hmm. you just think about video games, not God. Okay. Always, what about you? What are um, some ways you think you do a good job of keeping God first? I'm praying every night before we go to bed. Okay, so we always we take a we take a minute to pray when we eat. We take a minute to pray before bed to kind of keep ourselves aware of how God is always with us. Are there ways that it's kind of difficult sometimes to keep God first? Yeah. Like what? Like being with family and riding a bike and going to Nintendo Switch and watching TV. So, iPad. Otherwise, what I hear you saying is there's lots of stuff that can distract us from God. Uh -huh. Okay. What about you, True? Everything she said, and also some books, but not the Bible. Okay, yeah, some books distract you sometimes. All right, so shall we pray? Yeah, okay. Um, dear God, dear God, help us to always help, help us, us to always, always remember ways, remember ways that we can try that, that we can try to keep you first to, to keep, keep you first. Forward. Help us to find you. Help us to find you in the big moments. In the big moments. In the small moments. In the small moments. In all the moments in between. In all the moments in between. Help us to find ways. Help us to find ways. We can work hard. We can work hard to remember. To remember your love for us. Your love for us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Should we say bye? Bye. 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 Last week, Pastor Lori started a new message series on the Ten Commandments. And I don't mean to pick on someone who isn't here to defend herself, but I think it could be easy for us to wonder, how in the world can an ancient, you better not do, list be something helpful for right now? I mean, we've just lived through a year of you better not do's. You better not go out to eat. You better not be around crowds of people. You better not touch your face. You better not hug people. You better not let your nose and mouth be uncovered all willy-nilly in front of people. You sure as heck better not cough or sneeze in public. You might as well just step out in front of a bus. And yes, that stuff has all been needed. But also, I am so sick of you better not. So I admit that my spirit has balked a little bit at preaching as part of this message series. I wrestled more with this message than any other one in recent memory, and I think a big part of it is just that my soul is tired of you better not. But here's a dumb thing I've learned about myself in the years of being me. Often when my heart is feeling resistant to investigate something, it's because there's very much something in me that needs investigating. Darn it. So, if your spirit is also weary of you better nots, if your soul is resistant to taking anything else in, maybe take a deep breath with me, grab my hand, and let's see if there's something in here we need. If you're feeling more optimistic and full of faith, Feel free to shout out encouragements along the way. Today we're going to be looking at the second commandment, which says, Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them. In the ancient Near Eastern cultures surrounding the Israelites at this time, it was very common to create images of their gods paintings or wood or stone sculptures or little totems. These images weren't just artistic representations of the gods, though, as we might think of a painting or a sculpture. For us, the stained glass in our sanctuary is just meant to remind us of Jesus. For the ancient Near Eastern people, though, especially those in Egypt, the images of the gods were seen as having actual power, as containing a bit of deity within them. So people would pray to these images or idols. They would sometimes even dress them up in clothes or stage rituals to bring them to life. They would offer sacrifices to them. 
As God calls the Israelites out of Egypt, he seems to want them to make a clean break with this kind of idol worship. You better not, he says to them. This can't be just about the fact that the Egyptian idols were of other gods. That's already been dealt with in the first commandment. You must have no other gods before me. So they already know that they're not to worship other gods. Why then would God care about idols? Why couldn't they make an image of God? What's so wrong with that? In his book, Words of Life, Adam Hamilton says, Yahweh is not to be portrayed by means of images or statues, for Israel's God is the creator of all things. He transcends the created world, and nothing made by our hands could adequately represent him. It's absolutely okay for us to have a pretty picture that points us to God, whether that be a stained glass or a church building, or even a song or an idea. But, God says, be sure that you never forget that all those things are just arrows. None of them are God. None of them contain God. None of them give you a handle on God. What does that have to do with us now? I'm sure your brain can make the leap to some of the things we might be tempted to use as idols, as ways to counterfeit God's power. Money, politics, sex, even the church. We make idols of these things because we think they can give us what we want. And that's some important stuff to acknowledge. But I'm interested in something even a little bit below that. Why are we so prone to make idols? Why are we content with having a fake version of something when the real God has made himself available to us? Who needs a copy when you have access to the original? Let's look a little more into Israel's story at the time to see if it can give us some perspective on ourselves. We're looking at the Ten Commandments as found in Exodus chapter 20. Here's the response of the Israelites at the end of that chapter as Moses comes back to them off the mountain. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the horn and the mountain smoking, the people shook with fear and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. The people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness in which God was present. Here is God right in front of them, willing to make himself known to them and the Israelites want no part of it. You just go, Moses, they say. You're doing great. They're afraid. They have, after all, just seen God visit a horror show of plagues on Egypt. They've seen him part the Red Sea, and now there's lightning and thunder and smoking and random horns. Can you imagine? I'm telling you, I would have been out at the plague of locusts. My fear of bugs is a bit legendary, and knowing that God can loose billions of them at a moment's notice makes me a little anxious. As much as I know God loves me, watches over me with care, with self-sacrifice, there's still a lot about God that I know I don't know. God is infinitely big and can't be contained by any created thing, not even my imagination. It's human nature to be afraid of the unknown, and I think it's okay to say it out loud, I'm sometimes afraid of God. I don't think he wants me to be, but I think he understands that I am. And better to tell the truth and ask for God's help than to send someone else in to interact with God for me. That's not where it ends with the Israelites, though. After God gives him these 10 words at Sinai, Moses goes up to the mountain to talk with God many more times. And the Israelites make it 12 whole chapters before they get impatient with this system. They're still stuck in the wilderness. Where's their way out of this barren desert? Where's the land of milk and honey? How much longer till we get a little service around here, huh, Moses? In Exodus 32, verse 1, it sounds like this. The people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come on, make us gods who can lead us. As for this man Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what's happened to him. Just a little bit ago, the people were terrified of God and wanted Moses to go do the talking. But Moses isn't going fast enough. So the people decide to build themselves an image of God so they can have a version that goes at their pace. They pool all their gold and build a calf. 
The one thing God has asked for is their worship for hearts that are committed to him. But they're right on the verge of pledging themselves to some dead handmade cow when Moses gets wind of it and stops them just in time. What a contradiction. On the one hand, the people have seen God at work, but God's ways have been a bit overwhelming. So they want some distance. Moses, you go. But then things aren't moving fast enough. There have been promises made, and the people want them delivered now. So they build an image to coax God into. They want to bring him close so that they can get what they want. All the rewards with none of the risks. Back up when you're scary, God. Come close when you're handing out blessings. But God cannot be broken up into pieces and parts. God is full of grace and justice. God is present and invisible. God is good, but not tamed, to borrow a little bit from C.S. Lewis. God hands himself to us, but won't be put in our boxes. God is knowable, but endlessly so. We will never get him pinned down. We'll never have him fixed in a certain location. That's what's attractive about an idol. It seems concrete. We know where to find it. We know what to expect. We can see where it begins and ends. We can put it on a t-shirt and declare ourselves team idol. We can declare anyone who doesn't have that exact image as off the team. But that is all just made up human nonsense, an idol. It seems like we're getting all the benefits with none of the risks, but are we? Does money bring us joy, patience, kindness? Does political power bring us communion with God? Does sex or beauty bring us love? Does intellectualism bring us peace? Does us and theming the whole world bring us belonging in the kingdom? We may sort of fool ourselves into thinking these things work, but they do not. There is no substitute for God. There is only God and not God. And if we settle for not God because it seems a little safer at the time and a little more manageable, we abandon actual God and his grace. We choose the golden calf over the smoke on the mountain. I promise I understand why we do it. We want a sure thing. We want the security of certainty. We feel desperate to feel sure of something, to feel safe in a year of pandemics and violence and natural disasters and deep political divides, in a year where misinformation is king, where two people can make completely opposite declarations with exactly the same amount of passion and confidence in their evidence, in a year where turning on the TV or opening our phones is a daily assault on our souls, we just want something to be simple, to be a sure thing. We want there to be a right answer given so things can be settled. We want our enemies to get their comeuppance, and then we think at long last there will be peace. And it's tempting to believe that the concrete cow can do that. But God will never inhabit our idols. He may be in every other place around us, but never there. So what can we do to make sure we aren't giving our hearts to a safer replacement for God? We have to start with confronting our fears about meeting with God. Do you have any? Can you name yours? It might be that you're afraid there's nothing in the smoke, that God isn't real. It's all a big hoax. I've had that fear. It might be that you're afraid of God's anger and judgment, maybe especially if you've grown up in a church culture that's used God's opinion of you as a way to make you behave. I've had that fear that God is disappointed with me. It might be the unknown parts of God. What if we discover some aspect of God that makes us uncomfortable? I've had that fear. And maybe you're afraid of what God will ask of you. God's not shy about making difficult requests. I've absolutely had those fears. Or maybe it's some other thing. And I can try to combat all those fears. I can assure you that God is, and that he loves you deeply, no matter what. No matter how many people have tried to tell you you're unacceptable. No matter how many times you've told that to yourself. But God loves you. You don't need to hear it from me, though. You need to put yourself in a place to hear it from God. So first we have to confront our fears, put them honestly in front of God, 
And then second, we have to confront our own desires for control. The Israelites didn't build the cow just because they were afraid of God's presence. They also built the cow because they wanted to get what they wanted, when they wanted it, and how they wanted it. They weren't as interested in communion with God as they were with getting their wishes granted. And that's the ultimate idol building, to think that having our wishes granted is in any way better than, the, than experiencing the true presence of God. Why do we settle for fake and domesticated God when we can have real God? Because we imagine it gets us what we want. But friends, we better not. Because in the meantime, God is real and bigger and better, more full of love and blessings than we can even imagine. Just not on our terms, not in our timing, not without pain or sacrifice or change. If we want connection with God, we have to let God be God. It's not that God won't love us if we settle on a substitute. It's that we won't get to experience God's love because we're focused on our idols. You better not make an idol for yourself. And I am tired of you better nots. But this commandment isn't something that restrains us. It's something that sets us free. It's something that sets God free. One of my favorite prayers to pray is, release my heart to worship. Release me from the burdens and worries of my week. Release me from my shame, my pride, my doubts. Spending time in this commandment and this season of life, I'm challenged to also add, and help me to release you to God from my fears about you, from my desire to manipulate you, from my fixations on what you can do for me instead of who you can be with me. Help hold me to experience whole you in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. God, you made a promise to people long ago, a promise that's been extended to us, that you will be our God. And our promise and response is that we would be your people. You keep your promises, but we can get a little squirrely. We are prone to keep checking if maybe there's a better deal out there, a quicker pathway to get what we think we should have. Forgive us for our fickle and self-centered hearts. Forgive us for excluding others in our desperation to be included. Forgive us for thinking we have it in us to tell you who to be. Help us to see the freedom in this commandment, that we don't make idols because we don't need them. We have you, and you is freedom, the freedom that comes with truth. Help us to offer it to you in return. And as we spend time together face to face, deepen our love, expand our capacity to love you and one another. The words can be pretty, but the actions are hard. They may cost us something, but you are God. What else is worth a sacrifice in comparison? Thank you for your grace, so big it can even reach down to teach us how to receive it and how to love you in return. Release our hearts to worship and help us to release you right back. Amen. So we should worship greatly. No song is too loud, no orchestra too stately. To hail the majesty of our King. So lift your voices loud as we sing. our God, so let our songs be endless, so awesome His way, how could we comprehend them, so we will make it known to our kids, and we will sing about the gracious gifts you give. We will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because
Cause our God is great Oh, great is our God And we cannot Sing from our souls, affected by His greatness. His mercy covers all that He's made, showing His glory and His grace. We will sing Your praise and pour forth. our God is great, we will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name, let everyone give thanks, because our God is